Good afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm Willie Murphy. I'm from the Irish Blood Transfusion Service, where I've been for a mere 18 years. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk about um, the future of blood transfusion, which hopefully will carry on without me. Um, now, this is just um, sort of my take on some aspects of this, and um, it may be completely wrong. In fact, I hope some of it is completely wrong. Um, the great Yogi Berra, of course, who said many things, including when you come to a fork in the road, take it, made this, made this very perspicacious comment. And just to, to put that in focus, other great predictions of our time or of the time before us. So the guy who didn't sign the Beatles in 1962 said, if you don't like their sound and guitar music's on the way out. Thomas Watson, chairman of IBM, uh, world market for maybe four or five computers and you know, they, they survived a long time after that. This guy, okay, professor of economics, bear that in mind, all right? Um, so stocks have, looked what, uh, have reached what looks like a permanent high plateau about a week before the crash. They said, they said that, so take your professors of economics as you find them. This guy, Charlie Jewell, who should have known what he was talking about, said everything that will be invented has been invented at the end of the, of the 19th century. Um, this is, you know, we, we don't hear much about Pache's theory of anything at the moment. So Pasteur's theory of germs, is, of germs even is ridiculous fiction. And, and Lord Kelvin, you know, the guy who should really have got this together, inventor of the Kelvin scale, said heavier than air flying machines are um, impossible shortly before they were proved not to be. So everything that sort of looks even a year or two into the future has to be taken with a very large pinch of salt. And Robert May, who's my favourite, sort of the, the doyen of, of chaos theory and biology, said it, science does not predict the future. And in a way, we often expect science to do that for us. We think we've found yet you know, another track to, to the philosopher's stone. That's not what science is. It does not predict the future. It makes it perhaps less probabilistic. It shortens the, the time scale of, of uncertainty or the quantum of uncertainty. But scientific advice is nothing more than a sharper set of questions to guide us through the fog of the future. So, oh, that, oh yeah, I should have taken the link off that, shouldn't I? I Okay, I've nicked all of these images, all right. I'm sure that there are copyright issues, but we'll sort of deal with those uh, and the trolls um, as we, as we uh, get to it. Those of you who've <coughs> had younger sisters or children will recognize that look of fascinated horror on that child's <laughs> face. Um, and you can imagine what she's going to say afterwards. So what is blood transfusion? Why, why do we have it? Where did it come from? Um, this is... Um, an American GI in Italy during the invasion of Italy in the in the Second World War, and he's giving. It looks it's it's a, almost certainly a plasma transfusion to that injured casualty. Um, and blood transfusion didn't really exist in any industrial scale prior to the Second World War. There were blood transfusion services in a few places. There was one in London, and and Southeast England. There was one in Edinburgh, beginning to appear in Glasgow that was famously in Cook, Cook County Hospital in Chicago was one of the, was perhaps the, the biggest leader and a few other small places as well. But blood transfusion came into its own during the Second World War and mainly for plasma rather than for red cell transfusions. That's what they, that's what they use for resuscitation. Clinical trials being what they, what they are, this guy is almost certainly doing harm to that patient. Right, because resuscitation with plasma has been shown to be at best useless and probably not very good at all. Um, there, were some, there were some fantastic trials done in the sort of 1990s um, and beyond, and I'll show you one of them at, at the moment. But there was one amazing study done in, I was going to say Waco, Texas, but they could have done it in Waco, Texas yesterday or the day before, <laughs> but in, in Houston, I think. Um, where's Baylor College? Is that Houston? Yeah, and what they did was, uh, you were deemed if you were shot um, in Houston on a Tuesday, Thursday, or Saturday, or and then it, it sort of alternated the following week, obviously because it was every alternative day. Had you, if you were shot and, and sustained a penetrating injury between the neck and, um, and and the pubis, to have been consented to have entered a randomised trial, whereby you were either scooped into the A and E or 
they did this sort of thing. They tried to resuscitate you at the roadside or the wherever, the outside the Twin Peaks, um, and, um, and, and looked at survival. And those who were scooped and, and not, did not attempt resuscitation uh, did much better than those who did, who, who were resuscitated. And during the, the Falklands conflict, soldiers who were injured remote from the theatre you know, who weren't got to by the medics, did much better than the soldiers who were got to by the medics for the same uh, quantum of, um, of, of injury. And the reason for that is once you bled down, assuming that, you're, that your wound itself wasn't fatal, once you bled down, you stopped pumping blood. And then you went into a sort of, some sort of uh, homeostatic survival mechanism. Whereas if you, if you opened the circulation, they kept sort of losing good stuff through their veins. That's the logic, anyway. But anyway, blood transfusion had, had, its, had its beginnings down there. I hope every slide doesn't take that long. And, and now, pre predominantly in, in, in this country and in, and in most of the West, it consists of red cells, plasma, and platelets, um, possibly in, in that order. And that's really what the, the future I'm talking about. I'm not going to talk much about, except almost in the, in the very last slide, about plasma-derived products, factor eight, fibrinogen, um, derived from plasma donations. Okay, well, where are, where are we at at the moment? Red cells restore oxygen delivery. That's what they do. They do nothing else. Um, people think they, including a lot of physicians who prescribe them, think they may do something else, but they don't. So where tissue oxygen delivery is compromised or about to be compromised, um, red cell transfusion should um, be of some benefit. And in this country, we transfuse about 120,000 units a year. Um, we're, we, uh, the blood transfusion services benchmark against the number of units transfused per thousand population um, all the time. So up until recently, Germany transfused at twice the rate per head of population than we do, or more than that. And we're about where we should be. We're comparable to Canada, Western Australia, Northern Ireland peculiarly, um, and who else? Uh, that's, that's about it, really. So platelets, which we collect either directly by apheresis, where we hook a donor up to a machine, extract their platelets in plasma, and return their red cells to them, um, or we, we purify them out from the, from, the red cell, from the whole blood collections. But I'm sure everybody in this room has, has given many of. Um, and we give about 20,000 donations per year of that in this country, which is again about where we should be. Plasma is really to restore clotting function. That's what it does. It's not a great volume expander. It, it does the job, um, but you really give people plasma, which we collect and fresh reasonably, or freeze reasonably um, soon after we collect it to preserve the labile proteins. Um, and we transfuse about the same amount of that as we do, as we do platelets, and um, not so very much. Okay, so this is important. At the, at the moment, Western developed economies transfuse somewhere between 25 and 40 red cells per thousand population per year. That's a reflection of, of the care people take about it, but it's also a reflection of the, the efficacy of their, of their healthcare systems. So as I say, New Zealand, Canada and ourselves are around, are around the 25 mark. Um, Germany, the US, up around the 40 mark. But this is an important figure. Outside of a cluster of countries in the West, the figures are very, very much different. So we think of blood transfusion as a given. In fact, you can't do a lot of modern surgery. You certainly can't do chemotherapy. Um, and you cannot sort of treat leukemias and, and, and bone marrow uh, disorders without blood transfusion. Or you can't do it successfully. Um, and for that, you need somewhere north of 20 to 22. So these people are just not treating um, people who, who would expect to get, to get treatment in, in, in westernized countries. And that's, that's, that pertains to the majority of the world's population. And that's an important point as to where the future blood transfusion is going to go, because it is failing where the technology is not available to vast uh, swathes of the, of the population. Um, platelets, Western countries transfuse somewhere between three and eight per thousand population. Again, usually in relation to chemotherapy or bone marrow failure, 
but also in, in advanced surgery, such as uh, repeat cardiac surgery, particularly liver surgery requires platelet transfusion. But, but you, don't, you don't have it in low development index countries. I did a, a, a bit of work in Ghana, um, it's about five years ago now, and they made platelets. They had, they had better SOPs for making platelets than we did. They were in better condition, the, the, the SOPs, not the platelets. But they didn't actually have any platelets. They had one centrifuge in the corner, which if they needed platelets, they got the, um, they got the technician in who, to repair the centrifuge. They then, um, they then sort of made the platelets, which, by which time the centrifuge was knackered again. So there was a lead time of four or five days for a platelet transfusion, which was worse than useless. Um, so plasma is, 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 is about one litre per thousand population per year as plasma. And again, it's not available in low development index countries. Well, what do we need blood transfusions for? As I say, we can't really do, um, do blood transfusion or do modern um, medicine without it. Particularly trauma. Blood transfusion was invented for maternal hemorrhage. That's where it came in. Um, then it was used in trauma, obviously, during the war. Um, sur a lot of surgery developed because blood transfusion was available. It, was not, it didn't have quite the same impact as anesthetics, but it had a considerable impact in what surgery now became available. And it's used for extensively for bone marrow disorders and anemias. Well, how much do we need? These are close... I found this when I was looking for images. This is actually true. This is from... Um, the Watchtower, I think. Awake, sorry, Awake. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses magazine. And they are extolling the virtues of these three kids who died because they refused blood transfusion in the 90s. It was the most chilling thing I'd seen in a long time. And that's as much as I'm going to say about Jehovah's Witnesses, but you can imagine the discussions we have on our doorsteps when they call around. Um, so how much blood do we need? The witnesses would say, actually, you don't need any at all, and you'll be fine because you'll go to God. And maybe, maybe they're right, but we won't um, take that a whole lot further. You can do, and people do do, extensive surgery on, um, on Jehovah's Witnesses with some success. So you can do a liver transplant, you can do a bone marrow transplant, and there are some survivors. Um, but, the, but your survival um, goes down quite a lot. We have been able to, to get some, some fairly um, good data, I suppose. The, the, um, the refusal of Jehovah's Witnesses to accept blood transfusion, even during quite complex surgery, particularly aortic aneurysm surgery, has allowed us to define the safe threshold um, in a way that we could not have done in any, in any sort of prospective, randomized, ethical way. Um, so I'm grateful for that, I suppose. <coughs> they don't, but they, they're not contributing to my pension fund, so I'm not that grateful. So how much do you need? Trauma, it depends. So it depends on how much, um, how much attention you pay to the, the study, such as the, the Baylor College, the, the Houston um, one I just mentioned. Surgery, less than you think. Blood usage in this country has gone down 14% in the last five years or so. Maybe that's because surgery has not been conducted in our current health service, but I don't think so. I think a lot of it's because of keyhole surgery. Even a small amount of blood during keyhole surgery, and you can't see what you're doing. So whereas surgeons before were quite happy to let blood sort of, sort of spill into the sponges, they don't have that luxury anymore. They have to cut off even the smallest vessel so that they can see what they're doing in, in the telescopic field. And I think that has contributed hugely to the fact that surgeons now use very little blood uh, during surgery and, and after surgery. Um, and so about, only about a third of the blood transfused in this country goes to elective surgical patients. About a third goes to trauma and maternal hemorrhage combined, and the rest goes to anemias and bone marrow transplant and, and leukemias, cancers, and, and chemotherapy. <laughs> well, what's wrong with blood transfusion? Apart from the fact, and, it's a, and I think it's a, a huge issue, Apart from the fact that it's not accessible to um, in, inadequate amounts to about 80% of the world population, well, only a few things. There are supply issues, which I've alluded to. It's very expensive. Efficacy is, is moot, both in whether you give it or not and when you give it. Utility, it's difficult to use. 
and safety, which is sort of top of, of, of a lot of people's um, agenda. So there are a number, of, I, I use this as a teaching slide for postgraduate physicians. And the question is, what's the kid being transfused for? Who's the donor? And what else does the child have? And I won't expect you to know that the child probably has lead poisoning from eating the lead paint on the, on the cut. But certainly some children have got lead poisoning from that. So the child is being transfused from malaria, um, which is the commonest reason for transfusion in the world, despite the fact that, in fact, the access to transfusion in those places is, is fairly low. If you go around a, um, a hospital ward in sub-Saharan Africa during the dry season, they're empty. You go around during the, the, the rainy season, they're full, and they're full of kids being, being transfused. So, so kids being transfused, there's the donor, because there are no blood transfusion services. Right? Whether, whether she is um, that compatible or not, I couldn't tell you. In some places, you won't know whether she's got HIV or hepatitis, and they sort of feel, well, you know, the child's going to get what the mother has anyway. And in this country, and in most Western countries, any blood from a close, close relative would be irradiated to prevent a fatal complication of blood transfusion called graft-versus-host disease. Now, you get that with, with, um, with uh, organ transplants and bone marrow transplants. From transfusion, it's always lethal. So you can be absolutely sure that that unit of blood has not been irradiated from that mother. So a lot of kids are dying worldwide from graft-versus-host disease, and we don't have any handle on it. So there is some issue that kind of needs to be sorted out. Um, and, that's, so, and that's that one. So supply is, 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 is regional. In this country, we have plenty. We, do, we don't always have plenty. And because we, it, this is you know, an, an essential medicine, about 1% to 2% of the population in this country get transfused every year. But it's closer now down to about 1%. We can't buy the material. We can only trade in goodwill, and, and voluntary sort of engagement. If we lose that, as, as they do in, in some countries from time to time, then you lose the supply. So why would you sort of base a, an essential branch of medicine on something that you, that you cannot buy, that you have to uh, get from, from altruism and goodwill? Blood is not cheap. Although we get it for nothing, for a cup of tea and a biscuit, that's all in Packer crisps, if you like cheese and onion. We, do, we, don't, we don't do Guinness anymore. Do you, you know that, don't you? We don't, we don't do beer. We used, we used to be famous worldwide for that. The reason for that um, was that Guinness thought it was a good idea when they were marketing after, after the, um, the last war. They thought this connection between Guinness and health was, was one that they wanted to, to promote. It was a pure marketing ploy, a very successful, or part of an extraordinarily successful marketing notion that linked Guinness and health, which included giving free bottles of stout into every hospital ward in the country. Uh, and every mother who'd had a baby got, how many? She got two or three bottles of stout, I think, to, to boost her up, to boost up her iron. There is no iron in Guinness. That black, <laughs> that black is burnt albumin. There's a little bit of pyridoxine, I think, but that's about it. And the reason we stopped doing it, which was only about four or five years ago, is that Diageo wanted to break that link. So up until then, we always got it for free. Um, and it just kept up. And now they've stopped. We don't do it anymore. It costs us 250 euro. We are expensive in world terms, but we're worth it. It costs us 250 euro to put a unit of blood on the shelf, although we're not paying anything for the raw material other than the marketing costs. So we process, you know, whatever about running the, running the teams to collect them. By the time we're finished processing them through what is a clean room, this is a, a grade D clean room, um, put it on the shelf, ship it to hospitals, 250 euro. It costs hospitals at least that much again per unit transfused in handling costs, storage costs, um, compatibility testing. So this stuff costs about 500 euros a unit to transfuse, by the time it's transfused. That's expensive. So it's no wonder you can't find it in any sort of quantity in, in the uh, developing world. Efficacy, I mentioned, I mentioned the great Baylor College trial. I wish I'd been part of that, but hopefully a Tuesday patient. 
Um, just the whole notion of that Baylor College trial of assumed consent sort of broke su such new ground in, in pragmatic clinical trials. This is a brilliant clinical trial. It's now ni it's 1996, I think, that they did it. And these these are sort of the Canadian um, transfusion in a critical care um, critical care trials group who did really very, very difficult clin um, clinical trials. Because clinicians don't like to do trials on seriously ill patients. They want to, you know, they, they treat themselves as, as well. But anyway, these guys managed to do a multi-center randomized controlled trial of blood transfusion in critical care. And what they showed was it either didn't work or wasn't necessary because the patients who were transfused are much lower levels than people were used to at that stage. So they were transfused if their hemoglobin level fell to about half of normal. So if you know the figures, about seven grams per deciliter, the normal being around 14, let's say. When you fell down to about seven, and we knew that was the target from the Jehovah's Witnesses studies, when you fell down to about seven, um, you were fine. Any transfusions above that, the data suggested you're probably doing worse, and they were, they were indicating you were certainly not doing better. Now that's not to say that you're better off with a lower hemoglobin or as well off with a he lower hemoglobin. That's not true. What it says is, because, because we know that the higher your hemoglobin is during a critical care period, post-operatively or whatever, the better you'll do. But if, if you use the stuff that we'll give you, you don't do as well as if you use the stuff that's already in your own bloodstream, that your own bone marrow has made. So by the time we've taken this process that stored it and transfused it back to you, it has lost efficacy. It's not as good as, as when it was to start with. And that trial has been repeated, as you can imagine, gave rise to a lot of skepticism in the industry, but it's true. And subsequent trials have borne it out, and meta-analyses subsequently have, have, have said that that is true. And that's part of why blood transfusion usage has gone down as well. Utility, as I said, it costs, it costs hospitals as much again to use this stuff uh, as it costs us to make it. That bag, let me get this right, I should know this, that bag given to the patient who should have got that bag will kill them. Won't kill them all, some of them it'll kill stone dead. So here you have a perfectly good medicine on both sides, but used in the wrong way around, and the only thing that distinguishes them to the, to the clinician is a black and white mark there. All right? um, turns one from being life-saving into lethal. So the, the training, the infrastructure, the checking, all the counterbalances that go in to stop people killing somebody instead of saving them uh, is immense. We lose in, the, in, in this country almost nobody. That's not to say we don't make mistakes, we do. But in the UK, we were losing, when I, when I was there about 20 years ago, we lost two or three people a year because of mix-ups. And some of, some of the stories are just outrageous, but all they show you is that, is that, this, is, that this is a demanding medicine. There was one, there was one patient, um, yeah, there, was, there, there was one woman who, uh, I don't know which, which story to tell you first, but um, Mr. and Mrs. Kadlebowski, there are only, there are no Kadlebowskis in the phone book in this country, for example. There were none in Scotland, right? Um, but you can imagine that um, if, you, if there are, uh, you know, if Mr. The, the truth is, an Australian couple called Kadlebowski came into the country, hired a car, crashed the car, one of them badly injured, one of them not. One sent one because they were married. You know, in those days, people who were married were of different gender. One went to the male ward, one went to ICU. Um, they decided to transfuse. I think it was Mrs. Kadlebowski. Okay, in ICU. They went to the blood bank and said, can we have the blood from Mrs. Kadlab no, can we have the blood for Kadlabowski? Te technician has only just come on shift, doesn't realize there are two Kadlabowskis. There's only blood for one Kadlabowski in there anyway, because the, Mr. Kadlabowski had only been lightly injured and had, hadn't been cross-matched. So the blood for Kadlabowski, and it went the other way around anyway, one went off, ruptured his spleen or something, and they gave Mrs. Kadlabowski's blood to Mr. Kadlabowski, and what the, what the, what Mr. Kadlabowski had not done with the car crash, he managed to do with his, with his blood transfusion, and the, and the patient died. Um, be, 
just from a simple mix-up of somebody not checking. In fact, the blood was clearly labelled as for Helen Kadlebowski and not for Michael Kadlebowski. It was just people said, well, could only be one Kadlebowski. But of course, if there are only two, they're quite likely to be related, quite likely to be in the same car, quite likely to, um, if there's an accident. Okay, 1925, I made that figure up, but sometime in the 1920s, some guy out getting his dinner in the bush in um, southeastern Cameroon got infected with simian immune deficiency virus, and that started the HIV pandemic. All right, it happened three times, but that was, that was one of them, HIV one. Um, so that was fine, and the, the HIV spread as it does within the jungles of, of South Eastern or Western Cameroon for the next 40 or 50 years, and only emerged into the West because of other things. A railway that was built from Brazzaville um, up into the rainforest, something to do with the demand for teak and garden furniture in the West during the 70s, 60s and 70s, something to do with truckers, prostitutes, and ships down in the in the um, Bight of Benin, and the rest is is history. Now, HIV from blood transfusion is is a, is a very minor key in the whole discordant symphony of, if that's a term you can use, of HIV. But nevertheless, it's 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 been it's killed thousands upon thousands of blood transfusion recipients. I don't know about you, but I can't control people eating um, bush meat. 50 years ago. The point being that blood transfusion, by its very nature, is, is exposed to remote, seemingly inconsequential events happening very far away in time and space. And it will always remain that way. We take blood in this country from over 100,000 people every year, and we transfuse it to another 30,000 people. These are people who would not kiss one another, and yet we give them huge amounts of, of contagious biofluids from one to the other. And an emerging infection may appear and, um, and be spread for years before we know anything about it. Mad cow disease, which thankfully never became the nightmare it could have been, was first described in April 1996 in The Lancet, an article from Edinburgh describing six individuals who had developed Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease at, or what looked like Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, at a very young age. And because we were afraid because BSE had been around at that stage for 20, no, 10 years or so. People were looking for it. So they picked up these signals and they reported it fairly early on. At that stage, we did not know that it was spreadable to humans, although we knew it could jump to cats, for example. All the big cats in London Zoo died of, of um, TSE, trans transmissible spongiform encephalopathy, from, from dead cows in the UK. Um, so we knew it could, it could jump species barrier. We knew that some of, some of those jumps would go into primate species. We did not know it could affect humans. We certainly did not know it could be spread from human to human by blood transfusion. It's exquisitely spreadable from human to human by blood transfusion. It's a very contagious disease by blood transfusion. It's only happened four times, but the only reason it's happened only four times is there have been so few dietary cases. In 1996, we thought there could be 100,000 dietary cases and anticipated that, which would have made HIV in this country from blood transfusion look like a walk in the park. We would have lost about 10,000 people from transfusion transmissible variant CJD. But all the transmissions in the UK, and there were only four as it turned out, had all happened by 1996 because the, the disease had been taken out of the diet at that stage. Yeah? The sort of, we, we accept people who've lived in the UK up until the end of 1996, or after the end of 1996. But if you've lived for a year before then, we don't. So, so the, the food was safe by the time the blood transfusion service, by the, tr by the time the blood transfusion supply was known to be compromised. But the first transmission took place around the same time as the disease was first described. That's just the nature of blood transfusion. That is why I would think most of all it's well worth investing in getting out of this because it'll happen again it, it, by definition. We had our own, this is the old Pelican House that used to be my office just there, I got out just in time. The reason that the blood transfusion service in this country moved to St. James's and out of Pelican House was because of the hepatitis C scandal. 
because we allowed an infection to, to um, develop and, and run unchecked. Um, and and the, the blood and plasma industry is prone to these systematic failures on a grand scale, costing thousands of lives, once with hep C, HIV. The only reason we didn't have, have it with VCJD was luck, nothing to do with our skill. Okay, so where can we go from here? Well, what would solve these issues? This is, you're in the, the National Institute of Cell Biology, so you're obviously going to get this sort of answer. So for supply, a manufactured product, costs, perhaps a, ma a manufactured product, and come on to that in a minute, because half the costs are due to the, the, the post-supply issues. So you, whatever the cost is, you, you have to double that. Uh, for efficacy, utility, and safety, we do require sa technological c solutions, not the same way as we've, as we've always done it. So some of you will recognize this, this um, the, the, the mouse on the right. The mouse is being suspended in a solution of perfluorocarbon that's been perfused with, um, with oxygen. So perfluorocarbons have a linear gas exchange curve, high concentrations, it'll get into the lungs and cross into the blood vessels. And at low concentrations, you pick it up and it takes back instead carbon dioxide back to the lungs. It works, it works perfectly well. The mouse survived for hours drowned in that fluid, inhaling the fluid because it's, it's perfused with oxygen. It kind of works in humans. We used to use it a little bit in, um, in the late 80s, around the, the start of the HIV um, epidemic, when we didn't really have a, have a safe blood supply or anything that looked like it. There was a lot of call to use this, and we did a lot of clinical trials with it. Unfortunately, it's hepatotoxic. Um, so although it'll keep you alive quite nicely for hours with a, with a, um, with, with, with a zero hemoglobin, it, do, it does work. Um, you'll perish from liver failure shortly thereafter. So overall, the, the, the outcome is not considered entirely satisfactory. It's still available and on the pharmacy shelves in Russia. So it's commercially available. If you go on, you can, you can buy that stuff in Russia. And they use it as, a, as an emulsion which they dilute about 1 in 10 in plasma or, or saline. And they do use it and they never publish their results. These are cultured red cells, very nice and nucleated, biconcave cultured red cells. Um, so it is, and I'll, I'll come on to that in a minute, it is certainly possible to culture red cells, and people do it, and people have transfused them, cultured from, I think, um, in, that, in, in, in that instance, it was cord blood stem cells. So this is available, no, it's not available, but it, but it is, there are quite a few groups who are now culturing red cells to pharmaceutical standard almost, um, ex vivo. Um, the big problem about hemoglobin solutions and perfluorocarbons is that they don't produce nitric oxide or they don't influence the nitric oxide um, vascular, sort of cell vascular interactions. And that is why um, red cell substitutes to this day have not worked. Yes, they, um, they they will carry oxygen, they'll carry carbon dioxide back to the lungs, but they will not generate nitric oxide, which red cells do, which allows them to vasodilate and, and modulate tissue perfusion. So in every trial that is used, um, blood substitutes, either perfluorocarbons or extracted haemoglobin, the treated, the treated side of the trials have done worse because of vasoconstriction, they've no nitric oxide. Whereas cultured red cells, do that quite nicely. You'd have to believe me on that. I don't think anybody's really tried it. How about costs? Well, I would hope, have a reasonable, um, reasonable hopes that a manufactured product that came in at anywhere under 700 euro a pop will in fact make it commercially because the real cost is much higher than we think. And as we start to take out blood grouping, storage issues, supply, Inventory issues because it's now all own egg, or 95% or 97% of it is. Then, even though that's cost you twice as much as, as the own egg from us, you get rid of a huge amount of, of, of fuss and bother and scheduling. It means your patients don't wait while their blood group is tested and while they're having cross match. So they come in earlier in the mornings. You don't need a, somebody to take that blood, etc. The savings are around a blood transfusion or having no blood transfusion are such that, that a manufactured product could well um, make it. And that's sort of a, a, a big argument at the moment in the, in the 
ex vivo business. I'll give you the mobile phone, ladies and gentlemen. There is modern telephony in Africa in the rainforests. You know, they, they have no difficulty with phones without having to go through putting in all the infrastructure of a national phone system. Um, so they, they are as well wired as, as, the, as the developed West at the moment for a fraction of the cost. Although these things look expensive, compared to, to phones in the old days, they're an awful lot cheaper. So I think a technological solution will actually take the costs out. Efficacy and um, utility and, and safety would all be equally amenable to that sort of technological solution. The, the efficacy, the blood just comes off the, off the shelf. When we take a unit of blood from, from your arms, the, the average survival time of those cells transfused in, best, in their best condition is about four weeks. Yes, your red cells sort of live three months, but in fact, when we take the unit of blood out of your arm, it's sort of under the bell curve. Some of those units would have been sequestered by your spleen tomorrow. Um, in, in a week's time, some 10, 15% of the, of the blood that we've collected from you would have been sequestered. We will hold that for up to five weeks. With, with an engineered red cell, you don't do that. It all comes off in pristine condition, and you can hold it in that. Similarly, it gets rid of, of most of the safety concerns. You don't have to worry about the chimpanzees or the cows anymore, and the utility I mentioned already. So, um, this is real. There is a company called Novasang, which is funded almost entirely by uh, Optimism and the Wellcome Trust, um, which is a consortium of Glasgow, Edinburgh, uh, Cambridge now, um, Loughborough, who do the, do the real stuff, um, the Scottish Blood Transfusion Service, the English Blood Transfusion Service, and ourselves, and we make red cells from stem cells, and we do it quite well. The idea is that we would have gone to a clinical trial at the end of this year. We will not do that because we find it so difficult to, to enucleate um, some, of the, some of the more primitive sources, um, and we're, we're, we've shifted the whole thing into IPS. But we can make a physiological red cell probably um, probably in a uh, commercially viable way. And we're not the only ones. So if you want to have a look. What about plasma and platelets? Um, I, there are groups making, um, growing platelets ex vivo as well. Platelets are much more difficult to, to manage. We can only store platelets for five days after we collect them um, because, they, because they're platelets. Platelets are geared to to respond to stimuli by undergoing morphological and biochemical changes. Those stimuli include sitting in the bottom of a, of a plastic bag or a glass bottle. So they are difficult to, to manage. We can freeze dry them probably, and that's probably the way, the way we'll go. Um, even that's proved to be, to be very demanding. And plasma, um, similarly, I would think. So I, I think we, we will, perhaps if we have the will, um, and the patience and the, and the money eventually addre address most of those problems. What, what else? You put this on what? A book in Hodges Figures? They will look after a 10 euro book with a, an RFID chip. I cannot get anybody to put an RFID chip into a 1,000 euro perfectly matched platelet unit. The health system thinks this is too expensive to track their, and manage their um, their uh, their inventory and their, and their, um, and their, and their assets. It, the, the world is shifting. It has been, uh, and makes you wonder about blood transfusion. Blood transfusion, we, we do more or less what we did back in the 1930s, back in the 1940s. The reason we take 500 mils of red cells from you, it's actually about 450 mils here, and put it in 63 mils of citrate, is because when they started, they used pint bottles from milk, okay? That's what they had, so they could, they could sterilize them because the milk industry sterilized their bottles. They could put citrate in them, and they could cap them and store them. That's why we take the volume of blood that we do. The only reason. Nobody has gone back and looked and said, well, actually, that's not such a clever idea. You could do it much more cost-effectively by using half the amount or twice the amount. Okay? So we're st we, that's what we do. All right? um, so the notion that you could actually manage your stock and the blood that goes to let our county today is not irrevocably lost to the national inventory would save us a lot of money. 
ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what, do you know, how much does a second hand drone cost? Anybody got any idea? You get them for about, I don't know, five, five or six thousand pounds. There is no reason why we don't hold all the stock in a central location in Dublin. Somebody sort of taps an order into, in, up on the web somewhere and that gets dispensed automatically. It would save hundreds of thousands from the budget a year. There is no doubt that within five, ten years, almost all the blood in the country will be shipped around on demand like that if it hasn't, if it hasn't been replaced. Okay, this is an important point. You think, yeah, that's science fiction, but it's not, actually. In this country, if you've got haemophilia A or B, you do not get plasma-derived product. Since 1997, 1998, all of the people with haemophilia, certainly the new diagnosis, and at this stage now everybody with haemophilia A or B, and there are hundreds of them, don't get anything from donated blood. So remember hepatitis B, HIV, all the people with haemophilia who, who were worldwide, hundreds if not thousands of them died from HIV and hepatitis C. It doesn't happen anymore because it's all engineered proteins now. We're only a step away from doing that from blood transfusion as well. That's a very large step. You know, it's, how long is it since somebody's been on the moon? You know, when we, what, none of you are old enough, apart from Martin, Vincent, to, to, rem to remember that. But yeah, the, the technological promise that, that that moonshot gave us and we haven't been back since what, 1973, six? It's a, that was the first, that was the first. We went, we went, it, was, it went on for, for a few years after that until the television ratings sort of disappeared, which is probably true. Um, so we haven't been back for, what's that, 40 years? Um, but the, you know, the promise that was there. So I'd go back to my original slide, you know, it's very difficult to make predictions about the future. Okay, but we're, it's a, it's a science group. I'm not a great fan of Nicolas Sarkozy, but I have to give him credit for this. I just, I'm going to assume I'm so poor a fan that I'm sure somebody wrote it for him. But without basic research, um, you know, we're not going to get anywhere. And, and that is a real problem I find with, with big pharma and now with, with funding bodies, is that as soon as there's a sniff of profit, as soon as there's a sniff of application in the marketplace, they stopped doing the basic research. We should never have put together a red cell consortium because we hadn't worked out the biology of a nucleation. But, but we were forced to, to get funding to do the work, we were forced to move from basic to this. So we will probably have to go back a few steps, work out a few fundamental things. The whole, the whole thing about nitric oxide and red cells wasn't known until people did clinical trials of blood substitutes because people were, aren't funding enough basic research. And that's the same, I think, in, in, in cell therapy. Um, just, a, just a last comment, and, and that is about red cells. Red cells nucleate. They nucleate very effectively. You do about 2 million red cell nucleations per second. There's only one other cell in your body that does that, and that's the lens, probably by a completely different mechanism. Nobody knows, not just why you nucleate, which is sort of probably unanswerable, but how you nucleate. It's emerged over the last couple of years, it's, it's not just a single mechanism, it's a multi-phased and therefore probably evolved in lots and lots of different stages. It doesn't convey anything in terms of um, function. Trying to run a, an ostrich, you, you just can't do it. Or, you know, you don't, you, all mammals, all mammals, including platypuses, all the way down to platypus and echidna, all mammals nucleate all their red cells. Nothing else does. No bird nucleates. Um, there's one salamander who nucleates about 85% of its red cells, but it's just one little clade of salamanders. I um, don't know why they do that. But um, so red cell nucleation, which is so important, we cannot function. We can't. If you try and put non-nucleated red cells into humans, they clear them in the first splenic passage. They just takes them out. Nobody knows why, nobody knows what it's there for or how it's done. And until we get over that, we actually won't get to where we, we want to get. But we will, we'll get there. It's just a set of questions that have to be carefully answered. But it, it needs a lot of basic research before we get there. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Merton, for a memorable presentation. Could we not have questions, please? 
35, but yeah. And yeah. What, happens all, what happens all that stock and how much of what you collect is actually not used? What percentage roughly? About 2% uh, not is not used, yeah. It's higher, it's higher for platelets, but about 2% are red cells. I think I might have one of them down. How's that? Now it's gone. Yeah, right. I'll, sh I'll shout instead. Is that any better? No. No. Maybe it's gone for a while. I'll, I'll shout. Um, uh, platelets, it's higher. But what, what a blood trend transfusion service has to do is it has to meet 100% of the demand 100% of the time. Um, and you cannot do that without keeping inventory. That's, it's just a cost. So we, it's taken us a long time to work this out, but we actually provide two things. One is the actual product itself when you need it, but it's the availability of it. The fact that should you need it, it's available, that allows the surgery to take place, for example. So we do hold stock that to levels that, that that tend to overcompensate, and we have to, otherwise you'd be cancelling surgeries all the time. So it's very efficient overall. It's not bad. It's not bad. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, the red blood cells that you're manufacturing, like, yeah. is it totally antigen free, or is it just most N common antigen? N no. Um, at the, at the moment, um, at the moment, it's its own egg. Kelneg. So, uh, w what we will do once we work out how to do it is we'll we'll make iPS cells to certain specifications. And the ninety five percent will be Oneg, Kelneg, Duffyaneg, whatever. Red cell antigens tend to be functional proteins. So the the rhesus um, the, the rhesus protein is part of a, an anion exchange. Ke I can't, can't remember what the rest of them do. I'm not going for honors here, but but you can't actually remove them. They're, um, they're polymorphisms or dimorphisms of, of functioning elements of the red cell membrane. So we can't make them antigen free, but most of them are not particularly immunogenic. The rhesus, the, the rhesus um, antigen is very, very immunogenic because it's a big protein and it's a very rigid one. It goes up and down through the red cell membrane somewhere between 11 and 14 times. Okay, so it's it's a it's a very solid target for the antigen processing cells who recognise it as foreign, because it tends to act as an adjuvant, as an immunogen. If you're compatible for rhesus, you tend not to make antibodies to the other minor antigens. You need that to to alert or inform the immune system that this is a foreign thing. Um, similarly, Kel. Um, and Duffy are big immunogens. If you take those out, people tend not to make antibodies to the minor ones. So, so, so we, sh we should be all right, mostly. We'll, we'll, need, we'll need a few minor stocks as well. The, the whole process of cross-matching won't go away, but it'll all be done genotypically. So you won't be looking for serological mismatches, you'll be looking for genotypic matches. Radiation of the donated blood prevents the, the graft versus host disease is due to um, engrafting and survival of T cells from the donor. So if you were radiated, you don't kill off the cells, but you uh, cause enough DNA damage and, and, and breaks in their DNA that they can't actually proliferate. So we only give about 25 gray. I don't know how that it's. I can't remember what it used to be in RADS, but it's a very low dose. It's nothing at all like sterilization irradiation, which is about a thousand times more. So the, it does compromise red cell function, but not such, it shortens the shelf life. We can, we can only store them for a few weeks, a couple of weeks after irradiation, but, um, but they still function for, for that time. But it does stop the white cells from, from proliferating if they engraft. Platelets don't survive cold storage. I would, that's, that's one of their problems. We have to store them at, at room temperature, um, which allows bacteria to, to grow in them. Big problem. The, the commonest infectious problem of blood at the moment, I hope, 
because otherwise there's something else growing there that I don't know about. The commonest infection is bacteria in platelets because you can't actually sterilize the donor. So there's always a risk that you get a few bacteria in to the bag. In fact, you quite often do. Because we store things, the red cells in the fridge, that's not a problem. Those bacteria don't grow. In fact, they die off. But we hold the, red, the platelets at room temperature, so the bacteria grow. F mainly for that reason, we only hold platelets for five days. But functionally, they only last another few days beyond that anyway. Um, it, I, I don't know is the, is, is the answer. There, there, there are two things. One is, um, it's, it, we reckon that the most likely number of variant CJD cases that are going to occur in this country in the next 20 years is zero. Um, but, it, the, but the range, the 95% probability is up to eight. Um, and the worst case, I don't know how, how they worked that out, but we, the, if there were two, we wouldn't be surprised. So there are a couple of people probably still incubating the disease in this country. There are people who have incubation periods, you know, people who are, who are genetically resistant to variant CJD. It only affects one particular um, polymorphism of, of the prion protein, which is present in about 40% of the people. The other 60% could well be infectious, but the incubation period is so long that they that that they will predecease themselves, if you like. They'll 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 die of of old age and confusion um, before they get variant CJD. Now we know that from Kuru in Papua New Guinea, where the resistant phenotype genotype, the resistant both, I suppose. Um, if, if they lived long enough, could develop the disease. This, they, this is the one that they got from eating the brains of their grandmothers. Um, if, if they lived 60, 80 years, they could develop disease. Now, it's probable, given what we know about the disease, that during all that incubation period, your blood would be infectious if you transfused it. So, so we're still cautious. But we could probably, you know, we're getting less cautious about it. The big problem is the appendix data from the UK, which is very confusing and has, has never been resolved properly. Something like one in two and a half thousand appendixes in the UK from people who had their appendix out during the, and, and lived there during the sort of 80s and early 90s, one in 2000 contain infectious prion, meaning that those people have the, means one, one, of, one of two things. One, it's a complete artifact, and we don't know what we're talking about, which actually is probably true, um, or possibly true. The other is that lots of people get prion into their appendix, but it doesn't get any further, and that would seem to be compatible with the epidemiological evidence. Or the third is that there are an awful lot of people out there who've got the disease at a very low level and, are, and, and could well go on and develop it later. The problem with that is it's never been properly controlled. So nobody's taken, let's say, 100,000 appendixes from somewhere where there's never been any mad cow disease and looked for the incidence of, of infectious prion by the techniques that they use, which is immunohistochemistry, or has been. Um, so they're redoing that study at the moment with a proper control. But they, they, they did it a few times. And to be honest, you know, as far as they know, their tests are specific and sensitive, but they haven't had a control cohort. So they're now redoing that again. If that turns out to say, well, yes, there is a real one in, 20, one in 200, 2,500 incidence of appendix infection, then the answer to your question is never. Um, and, but, it, but if it turns out that it is artifact and that you do find it as a sort of natural event, then we'll probably lift the restriction. So come back to me in five years. Or ten years. But you can, still, you can still donate in the north. Okay. Um, yes, you can. And they'd be very glad to see you. You don't have to be resident there. No, no, they'll, they'll, they'll take um, tigs, mm, tins. Mm. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Or back in, or in the UK. They, you don't have to be resident on the, on the show, as far as I know. Good question. Thank you. I, I, I don't think you have to be resident in the north. I think they'll take you as a southerner.
Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks for a very long, one last question. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks for a very long view. Uh, which is really fascinating. Just want to ask you, uh, are there any hints about what the mechanism of any mutation is? Is there much research going on on that? Um, you, um, no. Well, yes, there is. We're doing a lot, but yeah. um, at the moment we're sort of looking at the genomics and the proteomics. But you've got to do it at every at every stage of um, of development. So you've got to usually if you if you grow a red cell um, ex vivo from a stem cell, it takes about twenty one days between starting taking your CD34, your undifferentiated stem cell, and growing out to a mature red cell. It takes about 21 days. You've got to do the genomics and proteomics at every day on, sufficient to, um, on a sufficiently pure culture to, to get the information. Um, I, it's, so I'm just going to speculate just for the last two minutes, because I think you know, this is an, an interesting question. The one, the one thing that makes kind of sense to me is parasite escape. Okay? Because it's not function, it's not thermoregulation. It is a very peculiar thing. It's present in all mammals and absent in all non-mammals. It is the most defining sort of feature, biological feature of mammaldom that I can think of. It's as strong as, as fur and thermoregulation. Um, so, it, so at some stage, somebody thought it was a good idea to kill off their red cell. The alternative is that it's, that it's iron husbandry. Be, about, um, about a third of your cells by number are red cells. The, that's a huge sump for iron. It's a huge demand for iron. But all your other cells need iron as well, particularly um, for reproduction. So enucleation shortens the lifespan of your red cells. So in, in, in mammals, typically red cells live. In a horse, it's about 160 days. In a mouse, it's about 30 days. It's birds also um, are down to about 30 days, but reptiles, their red cells live forever. They, they, they never recycle that iron once it's trapped in there. But, um, so assume, let's assume that birds shorten their lifespan of their red cells separately. What it does is it recycles your iron. It makes this huge resource of iron available to you, and you don't have to reset it at the same level. So it makes more iron available for procreation. It allows your red cells to function as a red as a, as an iron sump. So that's a plausible explanation until somebody disproves it. The other is parasite escape. Everybody's red cells in the wild are parasitized, um, and if you if you clear the red cell through your spleen, you you diminish your parasite load. So you could see why you know, a malarially infected um, reptile or whatever the proto-mammal was might in fact reduce its parasite burden if it, if it cleared its red cells from time to time. So they're, they're my guesses, but it's, but it's not function and it's not sort of what, what, you, what, what people used to think it might be. It's just not. Um, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm kind of interested in the, um, in the, in the, in the iron recycling thing. How you, how you prove that, how you even design experiments around that, I do not know. Certainly there's much better pictures in, in the books on red cell parasites in reptiles and birds, so I might sort of pursue that a bit better. It's much more visual. They've got, they've got great parasites, I have to tell you, reptiles. Yeah. What's the mechanism there? It's the spleen. Um, in, as, when, as red cells go through the spleen, there, there isn't a continuum from arteriole to venule. They have to get pass through fenestration in, in, in macrophages. Um, so the, and and they, they go through the spleen every you know, five or six trips. Trip if you take somebody's spleen out, either deliberately, which you can do for some immune diseases, or traumatically, people rupture their spleens, um, particularly in seatbelt injuries on, on that side. Um, then um, then when, you look, when you look in their peripheral blood, it's full of nucleated red cells. So a, a, a substantial part of the, of the physiological nucleation process takes place in the intact spleen. Over time, that disappears. Presumably macrophages in, 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 other, in other tissues take over the splenic function. But for weeks, about 1% um, of the circulating red cells, not as much as that, 0.1%, will be, will be enucleated. 
to the extent that probably a, a, large, a large part of enucleation does not take place before this, we are reticulocytes leave the marrow. They actually, it actually takes place in the spleen on the first passage or two. In a, norm, in a normal human blood film, there are no enucleated red cells. You just cannot find them. Um, but once you're splenectomized, they appear all over the place.